<laughs> Attention Kmart shoppers. We are having a blue light special on eBay. <laughs> Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Welcome to our monthly eBay listing. This is the video where we drop 20 items on eBay while you watch. If you're a level two or three member, uh, everybody else gets to see it later on. Uh, thank you so much to our level two and three members who make this video possible. We really enjoy doing this where we put 20 items that we curate and we try to pick a variety of things that are interesting and fun, different price levels, different collecting interests. We do a deeper dive into them and then they list live while our members watch. Take a look at the links in the description and you can see how the items are doing, where the bids are. It's an interesting way for us to experiment with the market and see what these items are selling for currently. With no further ado, let's take a look at our first item, which I'm wearing. <laughs> yes, indeed. This is an official Kmart shirt. I will stand up so you can see the whole thing. And it is by a company called Angelica. Now the person who owned this clearly worked very hard for them. It does have a, it doesn't have any tears or rips. It does have a few little smudges. It has a whole lot of pen marks here because obviously this was a right-handed person who put the pen in this pocket a whole lot. And then on the back, we see just a couple of little stains. So full disclosure here, you can see them there. There's three little stains. I have not made a big effort to clean this. Uh, so it is possible that somebody who knows how to do it may be able to get those out. But we don't see these shirts very much anymore because we don't really see Kmart much anymore. From a peak of over 2,000 stores in the 1970s, Kmart is down to just nine stores around the entire world, and I believe six of them are outside of the United States. Kmart had a great beginning, though. It was the Kresge company, Sebastian Kresge, who worked for the McCrory Five and Dime store. He worked for them for a few years and said, you know what? I can do this, and he opened his own store, and then he opened another store, and then he sold that store to McCrory's and used the money to leverage the company, and pretty soon he had 600 stores. Kresge was a five-and-dime discounter, and that was why when in 1962 they saw their city stores starting to really slump, they got the idea to open a mega discount store and they actually beat Walmart to the punch by about six months. So Kmart was the first major discount department store and at one time and for a long time it was the second largest department store chain in the country. The Blue Light Special was run between about 1965 and the 1990s, and I remember it as a kid. You'd go into Kmart, and they'd come on with that bullhorn. They'd have a little cart with a flashing blue light, and they'd go over to something that they wanted to discount, and they would announce Blue Light Special, and everybody would run to that part of the store and grab these things up that maybe had been a dollar or two and now were 50 or 75 cents instead, and they'd sell them down until they were gone. It caused quite a commotion in the stores. It was a lot of fun. It made up for the fact that shopping at Kmart in general wasn't really so much fun in my estimation as a child. Not only were the goods a little lower end, but they had some very Byzantine ways of doing business, which eventually was their undoing. They were very slow to implement computerized systems. I remember as a kid, you had to go to the counter and get them to approve you to write a check before you could go shopping in the store, and then you had to stand in another huge line to check out and use the check that had been approved at the first counter you went to. It was a very inefficient system, so there's not much left of Kmart today, but it had a great run, a great history, and you almost never see the shirts. I think when the stores close, employees were like, well, we can toss those, and they did. So I was very surprised to find this at an estate sale from someone who had worked there for quite a while and kept one of them at home. So we're putting it out. It's a size small. It fits me. It's a little tight. It'd be fun for maybe a Halloween costume, or if you are a fan of old department store stuff, and there are people who collect old department store related items, well, then this might just be for you. We are going to put it out at $9.99 and just see what happens. Now our next item here, and you can hear it tick, tick, ticking away, 
is this lovely New Haven clock. This is a 1930s clock. New Haven had been in business in, since the 1850s in Connecticut. And clock making was a big deal in Connecticut. They started out supplying just the movements to a company called Jerome Clock. Well, Jerome Clock went bankrupt right before the Civil War. And so to stay in business, New Haven bought their assets and started producing everything, the bodies, the cases, and all of that, and became one of the largest clock makers. There were a lot of clock makers in Connecticut, Ansonia, for Seth Thomas. Uh, but New Haven did very well in its namesake city. Uh, you can see that it runs. The alarm does work too. I will spare you the joy of that ringing. This is 1930s. So it's got a great Art Deco case, but they're really making the movements very simple. And so you have to give it a little bit of a shake to get it to work at first when you wind it. And I remember as a kid, when you saw these old clocks from that era, that was pretty much the deal. You had to give it a shake. Everything winds, the alarm works, the dials all turn. It's in great shape, and it keeps actually rather good time for these. These were done in the Depression again, and so they were lightweight. It was a fairly simple movement, and they didn't always keep great time, but this one seems to. I am starting this one at $29.99, so we will see what people think of it. I've seen them sell as high as $75 for this model. In fact, one sold recently that had been repainted for about 65 and this one is its original case in the original color. So I thought that was a fun thing. I have always liked the tick, tick, tick of a clock in the background. Uh, I'm not really used to sleeping with one anymore, but uh, it certainly is something you do get used to surprisingly after a few days of use. I have a little bit of art glass this time, and I wanted to show something very sophisticated that might be surprising to you. This piece here, which is cased glass, you see the, it's a very deep purple, like a black amethyst, you can see that. And it's in this nice cased clear. It's a nice big console bowl. Now, doesn't this look Scandinavian? It looks like so many things that were done in Sweden, and it was in fact done by somebody by the name Ericsson. And we can see the signature right there on the back. But this Ericsson was from Ohio. This is Carl Ericsson. And in 1943, he started to do designs in America that were absolutely right up to date with the designs they were doing in Scandinavia. So we think a lot about Scandinavian glass and Scandinavian modernism, and we give them a lot of credit for their designs. But Carl Ericsson was right there at the forefront. And it showed in his success. He ended up making things for the Corning Museum. He made things for the Smithsonian. This is one of his fairly famous shapes. And it's just got such rich color. It's very stately. I just think this is a very handsome piece. Carl Erickson produced until 1961. And when he retired, he decided there wasn't anybody who could do this as skillfully as he did. And rather than have it cheapened by being merged into some other company that might change the production or water down his name, he just shut the thing down. Ericsson glass deserves as much credit at least as some of the other glass makers we see from that time. And it is just a really beautiful piece, I think. We are starting this at $39 and we'll see where it goes from there. There was even a huge traveling display of this stuff that went around the country in 1953. So it was really, really well regarded in its time, and it's well regarded by collectors now. It's just that they usually think that it's Scandinavian and it is from the good old US of A. Our next piece here is a ceramic firm, a porcelain firm, that has been around since the 1820s and was very popular in Europe for a very long time. In fact, their original customers were Queen Victoria, the Rothschilds, and various members of the Habsburg Empire who controlled at one time everything from Spain to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Well, then the Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed at the end of World War I, and Suddenly, Hungary was caught into more of Eastern Europe. We started 
seeing Heron come into popularity with collectors in this country after the wall fell and the company was privatized in 1993. And when it was privatized, the ownership, 75% of it went to the employees and managers of the firm. And because of that, the quality has stayed very good. The factory has stayed in Hungary. The control of quality and the hand painting and everything is very meticulous. We have a lot of people interested in Heron. There's starting to be more interest in traditional porcelain in general. So I think this is a good piece for the times. I expect that it will probably sell somewhere in the 50 to 75 dollar range and we shall see what the market thinks of it but i think it's a very nice pretty piece and pretty is starting to be meaningful to people again people are starting to like pretty and traditional as much as they're liking modern and streamlined so we're trying to show a little bit of both in this group of items our next one, however, goes right back to streamlining, and this is a fun piece to me. I have always liked this stuff. This is a company also out of Connecticut. You'll find a lot of metalwork was done in Connecticut. Waterbury was known as the Brass Town, and this company originated in Waterbury, I believe. It was the Chase Copper and Brass Company, and I say was, but actually still is. This company has mainly made large industrial pieces of metal for various uses over the years. But in the 1930s, partly because it was the Depression and metal was not selling well for them, they decided to employ a lot of famous designers of the time, including Rockwell Kent, including Russell Wright, and including the fellow who made this, who was a gentleman by the name of Walter von Nessen. And Walter von Nessen had come over from Germany in the 1920s, he was primarily known as a designer of lamps. His swing arm lamps that he introduced are some of the most famous designs that he did. But he was one of the people who was hired by Chase in the 1930s when they decided they needed to make a bunch of housewares and sell those in an effort to keep the company going. Well, it turned out to be a really good move because this was made of chrome. And by doing very modern designs in chrome, and I know you can see the reflection of everything around me in it, so I'll hold it back where you can kind of see the piece more for the piece. Uh, but it was shiny, it was reflective, it was fun, it was not expensive like sterling silver, and because of that, it really took off in the Depression. It was considered easier to care for, the design is just great. He is known for these column bases. These are made of plastic, and you see the column on the top, but it's absolutely streamlined modernism. Uh, Walter von Nessen really was known primarily for streamlined Art Deco, and Chase Copper and Brass only did these designs for about 10 years, but they did 500 different pieces in the line. I'm going to show you a couple of things about it. First of all, of course, the lid comes off, and what this is, it's a bun warmer, although you could put anything in it that you needed to keep warm. It has the original cord. It heats up when you turn it on. It still works great. It has a glass liner, which is in perfect condition, and then in the bottom, the warming element obviously is in the bottom here, and in the very, very bottom, you see the horse with archer that says chase. It's very small there in the middle, but I think you can get a bead on it. And that is how you know Chase chrome pieces. They almost all are streamlined deco, and Chase did all sorts of different things, everything from bookends and candle holders to various small appliances like this. It's great to find one of these in working order. You really don't see this piece very often at all. I actually have a few pieces of Chase in my collection, and I think this is just a real showstopper. So we're going to start at under $50. I do believe that the value is probably closer to 100 So we'll see if the market agrees with me about that. Our next little piece here is a lovely little reticule. We're stepping back a little further in time with this piece. This is late Victorian, and this was made to hold your coins. We start seeing a lot of interest in this sort of thing around the same time as there's interest in medieval dress, and that's why a lot of chain mail starts to become popular in the Victorian era. Well then, people who are crocheting and crafting and doing thing with beads start to look at this and say, gosh, 
we'd like to make something like that too, but we'd like it to be a little bit more fun, a little brighter. And so you start seeing microbeads used in this. Uh, this one is really in great shape because it's got its original chain. This came out of a Rhode Island estate. I doubt this was ever used. It's got its little finger hoop. It's got the bars here. The way you would open it up is you actually, let's see here, well, I want to be gentle with it, so I'm not going to do it all the way, but you would actually slide this ring over these bars in order to open it, and then you slide the closure back down. Now, a lot of these were made commercially. I'm not sure whether this one was or not, because you could also find patterns to make things like this in various needlework books of the time. But because this one isn't needlework, it's actually beads. I think this was actually done by a professional company rather than homemade. We'll show you a couple of those books, actually. That'll be our next uh, lot, so you'll be able to see what people were using as patterns. It's in great shape. The fringe is good. The flowers are great. The color is good. It's just a little thing to keep your car fair and perhaps a little powder jar or something like that. Very basic things to take with you when you're running out of the house. And I just think it is the sweetest little thing. We're starting it at only $29. I suspect that the value is about double that. And we'll see if the folks out there buying on eBay auctions agree with that. Now I mentioned that you could find patterns to make those things in books like these. And this is our next lot. These are being sold together. And this is the Florence Home Needlework book. We have one from 1890 and they're featuring Cordicelli Silk, which was their main brand name. And we have one from 1887. The Nonatuck Silk Company was originally behind the Florence line, but it was called Florence because they were basically trying to imply that there was some connection to Italy with this. That's why the, the silk was called Cordicelli. The silk was actually from Japan and was sent to Massachusetts where it was made. But I wanted to show you some of the interior. Now in this one, they actually have a couple of clippings from another embroidery book, which we're going to leave in there. but. I wanted to show you, you see how there are patterns and you can make out of uh, silks and other things these lovely bags like the one we just saw. There's other patterns in here for all sorts of neat stuff. There's uh, mittens, as you see here. The graphics, I think, are just great. And of course, the point is to advertise the product and give you a reason to use it. So on the back cover, this one has its back cover, the other one does not. We have advertising for Willimantic sewing machines, because you need a sewing machine, and for Payson's indelible ink. So that is the 1887 version. You can see it was written on. Somebody was very proud of it when she got it in 1887, and she wanted to probably take it to a sewing bee and make sure it came home with her. The other one is the 1890 edition. We have a little bit of a loss there on the corner. There's a little stain at the top. This one is missing its back page, but I thought it was so interesting that I thought we would throw it in as a twofer because this one shows some other types of work that could be done. A lot of these techniques are still useful to people who are sewing, and that's who the collectors largely are. We're going to start them at $15 for the pair, and we will just see what the level of interest is, but typically they sell for about that much each. I think this is a very handsome piece. I have always liked book slides. I thought they were quite fascinating the first time I saw them. These are something you see uh, starting back in the Georgian era in England, and some of the early ones done in inlaid wood that were made by hand are quite valuable. Uh, but this is what they look like around 1890 or 1900. This particular one shows Minerva. Minerva in Greek mythology is known as Athena, but in Roman mythology she was Minerva, and she was the goddess of wisdom and justice and law. She came from Jupiter's head. Jupiter had a big headache and someone cracked his head open, and out she came as a full adult in her body armor. That's a pretty tough way to have a kid. So I just always like the way these telescope. So if you were a bibliophile and you have a little collection of books you want to display, you do this, and if the books get larger in number, you can expand it all the way out to here. It goes from about seven and a half inches to about 15. This is by the Judd Company, and this one does not have their 
trademark on it, but it does have their stock number. And it's pretty easy to look up the old Judd stock numbers. Judd was another company in Connecticut that was primarily a metalworking company and did all sorts of things. Originally, they did hardware for drugstores. Then they started doing everything from coat rods and curtain rods to bookends and book stands and all sorts of things. I think the design's really neat. They became very popular for mechanical banks, and the mechanical banks were where, because they were made of cast iron, that was where they started doing this greenish bronze finish over the top that you see on here. And the significance of that was it was to keep these from rusting, but it also gave it a very nice classical look, and that's why you start seeing classical designs like Minerva showing up on these. I just think these are great. These typically seem to sell in the $75 range. I'm going to start at a lot less than that, so we really are having some blue light specials. But we'll see if the market pushes it back up to its retail value, which I suspect it will, because it's a nice piece in good condition. And they are definitely interesting to a certain group of collectors. Uh, in this case, I suppose if you were into Roman mythology, that might be of interest to you as well, but mainly they are of interest to people who collect books. Well, my shift at Kmart is over, so it was time for a wardrobe change, and if I was working at the Juneau, Alaska Kmart, I might put on something like this. This is an Alaskan cuspic. These were originally the dress of the Yupik people in Alaska. Now a lot of different people in various tribes wear them, as well as a lot of the state legislators. Starting in the year 2000, it became popular on Friday at the Alaska State Capitol to wear such things. It's basically a hoodie with a large open skirt so you could layer a lot of heavy clothes underneath it as well. This one is made of corduroy. It is in the original style where it does not have a zipper. I would say based on this orange and uh, green trim, we're probably looking at sometime around the 1970s. I got it from a gal whose aunt had lived in Alaska at that time. I actually got three or four of these, but I thought this one was the most interesting. You see that it's very loose fitting. They've actually had trouble and there's been a call for more cultural sensitivity with people getting on airplanes wearing these in Alaska and being patted down and searched because they think that they're too blousey and they might be hiding something. Um, so that's been an issue. So you might not want to wear this on the plane, but it is a really cool look. And for people who collect Alaskana and really enjoy the cultures of Alaska, which I have to say are quite fascinating and they make such wonderful things uh, depending on the part of the state. You could have people who are wood carvers who do amazing totem poles. You could have people who do dress like this. You have stone carvers, you have tusk carvers. There's a reason that people think Alaskan related art and artifacts are really fascinating to collect. And it's surprising where some of those collections are. I got this in Tampa, Florida. And because I'm in Florida now, I'm not going to wear it very long because it's a little heavy for 80 degrees. But I thought this was nice because it has no stains, no tears. It's just really interesting. I'm going to turn around so you can see the back. And it just is neat to me that it has this connection to the traditions of the place and was in such good condition. It is tunic-like, that is deliberate, and I'm not the only person who has one of these. Pope John Paul was given one on his 1981 tour of Alaska. I don't know whether he ever wore it or not or if it's hanging in the Vatican somewhere. So I think it's a fun, interesting piece, and there is a demand for these, not just in Alaska, but who knows, maybe an Alaskan state legislator will buy this and wear it one Friday. We're going to start this at $35 and just see where the market is. Okay, I am in a much more comfortable Florida weather appropriate outfit now, so let's continue. People keep asking me about the 1980s, what's going to come back, and one of the things that I am seeing interest in right now that I think is worth looking for are figural mirrors. And again, you're going to see lots of reflections. There we go, palm trees. That's a little more uniform. I think the 1980s mirrors are definitely something to look for. There's various styles. Some are tessellated, meaning 
tiles that are continuous without breaks but do not overlap. So for example, you see those strip mirrors where it's four or six or eight very linear mirrors, long and skinny, placed next to each other to create one big wall mirror. I had one of those at the show in Mount Dora recently. Uh, the other type are figural ones, and the figural ones are where I think there will be continuing interest. They're stylish in a sense, and they're also kitsch in a sense. The Sculptures Guild pieces probably have the largest national distribution, so David Marshall's signature is what you're going to see the most, but David Marshall, even though he did a lot of great 80s looks, a lot of geometrics, a lot of things with calla lilies or palm trees or things that were definitely emblematic of the era, uh, he was not the only one doing this and not the only one signing it. And I'm looking for the ones with signatures because I think as time comes on, uh, goes on that the signatures are going to make a difference, just like they've turned out to make a difference in Lucite lamps and furniture, I believe that will also be true with these. This one has a signature here. You're going to see all my stuff. There we go. The signature that you see there in the corner is Don Farthing. And Don Farthing had a glass studio in Venice, Florida. And you can actually see that mark on the back here, which sometimes is peeled off. But in this case, we have it. So we have the Don Farthing glass studio handcrafted in Florida. And so they were selling these as souvenir pieces, but we see them a lot in Florida because they definitely fit the 80s mod. If you weren't doing Golden Girls, you were probably doing Deco Revival, and this definitely fits it. The other thing that I think is neat about this is the fact that it's a sailboat. So it's cross-collectible. It's not strictly an 80s thing. I got this actually in Kentucky near Land Between the Lakes where it had been in a lake shore home for a very long time. So uh, there's a lot of different potential places you might find pieces like this. Um, this one is about two feet tall by a little over a foot wide. I usually am finding these selling now in the $75 to $95 range. And some of the larger ones, I know some of the um, David Marshall ones are selling for three figures easily. So definitely an up and coming area to look for. We're going to start this one at $49. I think this has the greatest shape. This is Red Wing Pottery, believe it or not. Yes, the company that made the Crocs. Uh, there were a lot of different potteries in Red Wing, Minnesota, and at a certain point, the Red Wing Union Stoneware Company, when you see Red Wing Union on a crock, that means it's from, oh, about the 19-teens on, because they merged a whole bunch of the little potteries into one, hence the Union. But in the 1930s, like a lot of companies, they realized that they couldn't just stick with their traditional product or they would not have enough business to survive. But pottery could be made into art. And so they hired a guy named Charles Taylor to design a lot of dinnerware lines for them. And they also started designing artware. This is from the 1950s. And you can tell because it's got these interesting, it's three different shapes. So you can arrange flowers in different ways, but also so it will look like a piece of sculpture on the table if you never put a flower in it. And that was the idea. I like that it's the two-tone with the green interior. Uh, so it's kind of a surprise pop of color. The white colors seem to do really well with modernists, actually. They made a lot of things in white to be contrast against colorful painted walls or to be surrounded with colorful art glass or other objects. So this can really serve a few different purposes. And I just thought it was such a neat shape. Here's the red wing mark on the bottom. Red Wing originally only did pottery for rum reel. You'll see early rum reel pieces. George Rum Reel had Red Wing produced for him. His stock numbers stop at about number 600. Then when he went on to work with Gonder and Shawnee Potteries, Red Wing said, well, you know what? We should keep making this stuff. So the larger stock numbers mean that these were pieces done by Red Wing for Red Wing to sell. Very progressive for its time. Really neat look. It sort of looks like a basket. It's very important with these because it has all these pieces. Oftentimes you see cracks along these rails here. And this one is absolutely flawless. So for that reason, I thought it was a great piece. It should be perfect for spring for somebody. And we are starting it at only $19.99. So we will find out who that somebody is. I have faith that that one is going to definitely be a seller. I had a whole collection of that a couple of years ago, 
And I've got to tell you, I think I've got two pieces left out of a big collection because it has been very popular again. We're going to step back in time here to a time when patent medicine was big stuff. Everybody wanted to be cured of all of their ailments, and there was starting to be more and more understanding in the Victorian era of how some of those ailments were caused, but there wasn't a great understanding as to cures, and there were not a lot of regulations about cures either, and so you would have people go town to town and sell you all sorts of horrible concoctions that were supposed to make you feel better, and the reason they made you feel better is most of them were full of alcohol, including Hood sarsaparilla was made in a giant factory in Lowell, Massachusetts that started in 1875 and very quickly it became one of the most well-known products in the United States of America. And why was that? Well, they caught on very early to chromolithography in advertising. So they started making lots of trade cards. Trade cards were little cards that you would give out at a store to get people to remember to come back for a particular product and they were always very pretty so that you would go home and paste them into a scrapbook and look at these pretty designs and be reminded of the product that was for sale. That was the idea behind them. Well, Hoods really took it from there and they started doing posters and they started doing cookbooks and they started doing a series of calendars that went on for, gosh, 45 years, uh, pretty much to the end of the company. At the time they made this one in 1888, Hood's sarsaparilla had all sorts of things in it. Some of them weren't really good for you, but they were supposed to cure all sorts of things, everything from rheumatism to heart problems to dyspepsia. It was an amazing wonder drug and it had 18% alcohol. So you were going to feel pretty good after you drank that bottle no matter what. Also, we're starting into the age of temperance. Well, how can we have our hooch if we're trying to be subtle about drinking because drinking suddenly is considered maybe not such a good thing? Well, we have medicine. We have to take our medicine. So sarsaparilla became medicine for a whole lot of people at that point. Uh, this is a die cut, meaning that they would do a cut and you can see the hole so it could be hung on the wall. This one has never been used. Yes, this is absolutely original. It looks flawless because this came from the collection of someone who used to be uh, big in the American Antique Advertising Collectibles and uh, organization. And so they framed this one up so it wouldn't get damaged. We are starting this at only $20, but I believe the true value is closer to $50, and we'll find out when we see how it does. Well, I'm from the West Coast, so of course when I saw this initially, I'm thinking, Arizona State University, but they're the Sun Devils. Did they have some sort of mascot who was canceled that I don't know about? Well, no, they were always the Sun Devils. This is Arkansas State University, and it says so right on the back. This is chalkware. And it is designed by this person, Wayne, and Arkansas State University, 1985. And Chief Big Track was actually a real person. They named their mascot the Indians after this Osage chief. By the 1990s, when they were trying to reinvigorate and restore the mascot, they actually went to the Cherokee and said, tell us what we need to do to make this politically correct. And so the Cherokee instructed them on the styles of dance. They did beadwork for them. Uh, they helped them with the costuming and made sure that it was all very accurate. So by the time the NCAA ban came in, it was a little bit unfortunate because they'd really made a big effort to move away from the cartoony figures and actually use it to pay tribute. The reason so many Native American names were used for sports teams really has a lot to do with the Indian school in Pennsylvania because that's where Pop Warner took the Native American students and created new plays and created the new, what we consider the modern era of American football. And they were really fearsome and they kicked butt. And everybody else suddenly wanted to name their mascot after an Indian or a Native American tribe of some sort because that was considered tough and cool. It might have been 
naive, but it wasn't necessarily meant to be derogatory at all when it started. Um, so Chief Big Track, well, he is no longer. In 2008, they changed it to, I believe, the Red Wolves. So Arkansas State University no longer uses this logo, but he is in really great shape. He's an interesting piece, and I thought that was an interesting story that I wanted to share. So this guy is going to go out. I've never seen him before. We're going to start him at 1999, and we're just going to see what the market is, but I think he's very interesting. This next little piece is near and dear to my heart. I had never seen this piece in person before until I was on a live sale with Heidi from Rosie's Antique Auction, and she had one, and it sold for about the price it should have, and I suspect this one will too. It is a very pretty cranberry glass face, and it is sand carved, so it has the effect of cameo, but they're just using a single layer of glass and carving back as opposed to doing deep hand carving like Cameo Glass would do. But it still has very good relief. It has a very sweet little hummingbird on the bottom. And it was made by a company that was very well known for Cameo Glass, and this was kind of their last ditch effort to keep going. This, if you see here, has a carved signature that says Kelsey. Kelsey Murphy, who is now the resident designer for Blanco Glass, he was the designer for the Cameo and Artware division of Pilgrim Glass, and I got the pleasure of meeting her, a very interesting person. She and her partner, Robert Bonkamp, did a lot of really great designs. The most expensive thing I own is a Pilgrim Cameo piece, as far as collectibles go. The Cameo art line made them a lot of money, but by the year 2000, things were starting to be difficult in the art glass industry. And then the Gulf War started and the price of natural gas shot up so high that Pilgrim closed their doors. So this is 2000, this is the year before they closed. They wanted to have something that had the Cameo look that would introduce people to the line and get them interested in it so that they could sell the more expensive pieces. That was how they were going to stay in business. A lot of their customers, even though the Cameo lines and this carved piece are very naturalistic looking, a lot of their customers were actually in the New York City area. And so they had a sophisticated high-end clientele and they wanted to make a piece that was a starter piece that would lead people towards that. This is very pretty. It is cranberry glass. They had to use 22 karat gold to get this color. So it was always a little bit of a premium, even if it wasn't carved. And then with the carving as well, it's a very sweet piece. I saw it sell for around $50 in the live sale that we did. I'm starting this at $19.99. So we're gonna let the market have fun with that and see where it goes. A lot of people who collect modernism really like these, and particularly barware collectors. And that makes sense because that's who this was made for in the first place. This is a Kurok tray. Kurok of Monterey. I'm going to stick my head around here so that I can make sure that you can see this. We are getting a lot of glare, so there we go. We'll tip it down so that you can see her a little better. Kurok is a very interesting company. I'm going to turn it around to the back so you can see. They're usually marked like this. Sometimes they have the Kurok giftware label on the back as well. They were made in the Monterey, California area, and they were made by a fellow named Guthrie Courvoisier, who worked in plastics and in the Second World War had to work with phenolic resin to make things for airplanes. And with the skills he learned doing that, in 1948, he and his wife who was a woman by the name of Moira Wallace, she was a child prodigy as an artist. And so she did all of the designs and he created the trays and the pieces that the designs were done in. And she used all sorts of things. She used everything from coral and seaweed that they found on the beach to metal pieces, coins, anything that you could inlay, wood, and so they're really rich and they're very interesting designs. And this one I thought was particularly interesting because while it is not by R.C. Gorman, it certainly looks a lot like R.C. Gorman's work. R.C. Gorman was a very interesting to, uh, fellow because he was considered by the New York Times to be the Picasso of American Indian artists. He became very, very famous for his very vibrant designs with very loose forms based on things he saw during his uh, childhood. He was Navajo. Very, very popular in the 1970s. 
at the same time, Kurok was very popular in the 1970s, and it was being sold at a lot of higher-end department stores in the town I grew up, Bremerton, Washington. The high-end department store was Bremer's, named after the town founder, and it was a cut above the J.C. Penney's and the other things we have, and that's where you had to go to get these. You couldn't get these at Penney's at the time because they were just a little bit more upscale than that. And they are very collectible now. It's important to look for scratches, even though they're really well made to resist alcohol, resist uh, cigarette burns, which is why they were good for barware. Uh, they do scuff a little bit over time. This one has just a little bit of light wear here, which I want to show. It's really not as visible as it looks, but I want to show it under my bright light so that you can see if you tip it back like this, which is how it looks, you really don't see it at all. But I like to make sure I give full disclosure on these sorts of things. Uh, it's it's a really neat piece. It's going to start at $19.99. I believe the value is closer to four times that. We saw the Ericsson console bowl earlier, and I wanted to share another piece that people often confuse the makers because this one is HomeGuard, made about the same time in the early 1950s. HomeGuard is another really interesting glass company. They are from Denmark. They were started in the early 1800s. A fellow who lived near HomeGuard, which is where the peat bogs were, realized that the peat could be used to fire industrial plants, and he decided that Denmark needed a glass making factory. So he got permission from the King of Denmark to do that and then died. And he was married. The Countess was quite amazing for her time. This is long before women had rights, even in Denmark where they came early. But she followed through with her husband's plans, even though she had no experience in glass making. And she found people who could design a very nice series of glass bottles. And that's what they made originally. So she got it off the ground. And it turned out to be very, very successful. It went through a number of different designer managers, and not one of them had glass making experience when they came to the firm, and all of them ended up being really great designers in their own right, including this fellow. His name was Per Litkin, this Minuit heart vase which came out in 1956, is one of his most famous designs, and he did this really wonderful deep smoky color in it. It's just such a nice, rich color, and I'm starting to see people being interested again because of the switch to gray interiors that we're seeing. People are starting to like smoke colors in glass because they contrast really well with that and give a little bit of dimension while still keeping that sort of monochrome. Now, these pieces usually had a paper label. You will not see a signature on the bottom because they were marked with a paper label that was taken off. This was a very popular line, so you will see this piece around. We're starting it at just $29. It's a nice, heavy, substantial piece, and so we will send this along to its ultimate owner very soon. Now, we have another important little booklet since we've been talking about quack medicine and early advertising. Well, this is advertising for Dr. Young's Radical Remedy because he can help the man or woman who is afflicted with constipation or piles or any other number of really terrible, terrible afflictions. And isn't that wonderful? This is from about the first decade of the 20th century. It is not in perfect shape. You can see that the cover is not off, but it does have looseness. It does have a tear. It does have tape on it. But it's worth preserving this for a couple of reasons. First of all, it was put out as a sales booklet by the Physician Supply Company of Philadelphia with their high-grade surgical instruments. I'm sure those were wonderful as well. But Dr. Young's radical remedy, well, it really was radical. After going through a very thoughtful treatise about the intestines and how things work, it's all very scientific. Well, then we get to the important part, which is the product, because the cure for your constipation and piles, and I have seen these on one occasion for sale in an antique mall in Oregon, are Dr. Young's Ideal Rectal Dilators. And yes, they are exactly what they look like. And when you see them in the little box, if you ever happen to run into a set, they're very hard to find, as you can imagine. Well, they're everything you can imagine. And they also came in larger sizes, up to five inches, depending on what your affliction was. These caused a 
different kind of painful reaction when applied, but they definitely sold ointment and other things as well. And there's just some wonderful reading in this. In order to use this treatment successfully and obtain from it the great and lasting benefits, the dilators are only sold in complete sets of four. And then they go on to describe how they are going to be used in somewhat lurid detail. The person who gets it will have a rip-roaring time. I laughed out loud several times reading the book. Again, it's a little delicate, so we're going to be sending it in this sleeve. It will be the remedy for all of your ills. That remedy is going to start at $9.99. Now, if that is not your idea of a way to deal with your problems, maybe a beach vacation is a better choice for you for your healing. And if you were going to take a beach vacation, well, you might want to come to this place. This is the Albo Beach Hotel. It still exists in Bermuda, although they're mainly the hall is mostly empty and just used for events, and they have a lot of bungalows and little beachfront cottages now. But back in the 1920s, when this beautiful serving plate was made by the Hoods Company in Fenton, England, this was what the hotel looked like. And you would sail off to Bermuda and cavort on the beach and swim in the pools and relax and have a wonderful time. And look at the great border, all of these really cool fish and sea life. This is one of the dinner plates that would have been used in that hall. So it's a little bit on the heavy side. It is officially cafe wear. I'll show you the back. It's got a double back stamp. The maker is Hoods Limited, Fenton underneath, but then they also wanted the Albo Beach Hotel back stamp on there. And even the back stamp is cute. The part you're never going to see, they put a lot of effort into. These are transfer decals. They were very elaborate. A lot of seaside resorts had plates like this done in the 1920s and early 30s. Uh, the very famous Vinoy Hotel here in St. Petersburg, Florida has a wonderful, beautiful plate similar to this. Uh, there's a lot of people who collect restaurant wear, and the ones who do really prize patterns like this, where they're very, very beautiful, multicolored, lots of detail, show the old hotels the, the way they were, and it's just really, really neat. So this one is going to start at $29, and we will take it from there. It's hard to imagine now that women's liberation did not start until the 1970s, but in the 1960s, the girls were still expected to be homemakers, do professions that were approved for women, like teaching and nursing, which were wonderful professions and very important, but women were still really limited in their opportunities. And the idea was that you probably were going to graduate from high school, marry as well as you could, and move off and be a housewife. And because of that, older generations of women were trying to convince their daughters that they needed to sign up for things like silver and china patterns. And yet, those girls in the 1960s wanted something that was a little more modern and a little more hip than what mom had. And that is why the toll company came out in 1968 with this pattern. These are all in the original package, so I'm going to have to show them to you that way because I don't want to open them. But this is called Toll Laureate, and it is a very late 1960s pattern because it has what they call Niello. Niello is a combination of black sulfur and lead sulfites and copper that is used to blacken. It puts a black permanent patina. And they liked to do that in the recesses of patterns in the late 60s because that was considered a very modern look. You see it in stainless steel as well, and a lot of these patterns are selling very well now. This lady who I got this from, well, she said, yes, my mother wanted me to go ahead and pick a pattern. So I did, and she got exactly two place settings, and then Women's Liberation happened, and she said, I decided I wanted to go to college and have a career, and I wasn't much interested in staying home and entertaining, so I never finished out the set. But here it is, would you like to sell my two place settings of Laureate? And I said, well, absolutely I would, because I think it's an interesting pattern, and it's so nice to find these all still in the original packaging. There is interest now 
in building sets of sterling silver again because number one, the price of sterling silver has gone up tremendously since 1968, so it's seen as having intrinsic value. Number two, it is good to get a little bit of silver in your diet and eating off of silver is a really easy way to do that. And number three, well, it's uh, we're seeing an era where people they don't want to return to the old stereotyped roles but they do want to return to a certain level of comfort and have finer things in the home and these are appealing to modernists as well as people who like traditional decorating so it's actually become a pretty popular pattern recently after languishing for a long time in the marketplace a lot of this stuff ended up getting melted down and so we're not seeing so much of this pattern anymore so i was very happy i have two five piece place settings so we have the teaspoon we have a salad and a dinner fork we have the tablespoon and we have the knife these obviously have never been used. We can piece them out individually and they would sell between about $40 and $60 each, but we're actually going to put them together. And you know what we're going to do? <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm going to start these at $9.99 with no reserve. And the reason why is because when you're selling sterling silver on eBay, people know that it has inherent value. They know that it has a certain weight. Those are very easy things to find because there's listings for these things on replacements limited. It's very easy to get details on this. So people know that this is potentially a few hundred dollars worth of sterling. And I have faith that the market is going to take this to where it should go, particularly because they're new in the wrap. So we're going to be bold and brave and start these out at an insanely low price and let them go up to the price that they should be and we'll have fun doing it. I have two sets. I'm trying to figure out, I know that with eBay, oftentimes you can sell, you know, if you have a multiple, you can say times two and sell both of them. If we can do that, we will. Otherwise I will sell one set and then let the buyer know that there is another set available. And that brings us to our last piece. And our last piece is something that is so fun and so cute and so whimsical. And I just have always really liked this. And that is the Merry Mouse. This is Holt Howard. This is from 1959, about the same time that they're coming up with the Pixie Wear. They came up with the Merry Mouse, which is a small set of various serving pieces, and their little motto, which they had at the displays at J.C. Penney's and other stores that carry this, was, for every house we have a mouse. Don't be nervous, they're made for service. And that little mouse isn't going to hurt you, although he would love to eat your stinky cheese. This has the Holt Howard mark on the bottom and copyright 1958, which is when it came out. Holt Howard actually had been in business for a number of years before that. Um, Grant Holt met the Howard brothers when they were all attending Amherst University in Massachusetts. And when they were at Amherst, they said, you know, we ought to go into business together. And so they did, and they created a very, very wide line of very successful pieces. They started out mainly doing seasonals. Christmas. That was the main thing they did. And they started importing from Japan and they were very careful about the designs and the quality. And so these were fun, they were whimsical, but they were also well made and they were vibrant and interesting. Of course, the most famous thing they did was the pixie wear. Now, the reason, and they are whimsical, cute, and totally hot, and that is still the case, even though this book, my mother has a collection of these, so this is her book. And this book came out in 1998 and was written by a fellow named Walter Dworkin. Well, Walter Dworkin came to the West Palm Beach Antique Show two months ago, and he bought the milk tumbler with the cow that moves when you turn it upside down for me. And I got to meet him, which was such a pleasure, because I've always loved his book, and I've always loved the stuff that Helt Howard made. And yes, indeed, he shows stinky cheese in the book, and there it is right there. So it was just so exciting to find a piece or two or three that were from this company that I really enjoy and then to meet the person who really discovered them and put them on the collector map. 
back when people were like, well, this is cute, but what is it? He was the one who did the research and wrote the book. And so uh, having done that myself with the treasure craft and pottery craft book, I have real respect for the amount of work it takes. It took me one year to do my book. And he said it took him about the same time to do his. So uh, it was just so fun to meet him. I just think this is a great piece. We are going to start it at $49, which is what he said it was worth in 1998. And the prices have definitely escalated from there. So I'm expecting that this will do well and that we'll see bidding up from there. It is in perfect shape with no chips, cracks, or any condition flaws, which is very important because as well made as it was, it was also lightweight because it had to be shipped over from Japan. So you do want to look carefully at condition before you buy. It has been so much fun bringing this to you. If you will now go to eBay and check those links in the description below, you will be able to see how these things fare in the marketplace. If you like any of these items, you will have the opportunity to purchase them. And again, if you're a level two or level three member, you get to see them as they list. And if you are not a level two or three member, well, look at the membership information in the description way down in the bottom of any of my videos, and you can find out more how to do that. Thank you so much, and we will come back and tell you how these things did in our next What Sold video. Bye for now.